only mode. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for our webinar today. It's great to see so many people attending. Um, can I just, uh, if, if people can on the chat, just let me know if you can hear me. Uh, that would be great. Wonderful. Seems like uh, everyone's uh, hearing nice and clear. Uh, so my name is Charlie Roger. I'm the marketing manager here at Bullhorn. For those of you who don't know who Bullhorn are, uh, we are the number one CRM provider for the recruitment industry. Uh, we've been around for around 18 years now, and we have a wide product set that complements our main Bullhorn CRM. Uh, a couple of these are our onboarding system, our standalone VMS, uh, to which we've recently added Slingshot. So you can now uh, pull and uh, push VMS requests directly from Bullhorn uh, and push candidates in with no manual work. Um, we also have our, our sales jewel tool, which uh, some of you might be aware of. It's a, a gamification tool uh, and an interactive fantasy football game, uh, which you can use to, to promote your sales teams. Um, Last year, we also released our Canvas tool, which is a, a brand new ad hoc reporting suite. Uh, and we have some really exciting products coming up in the next uh, six to 12 months, including Bullhorn Bots and, and our new release of Novo. Um, if you'd like to know a little bit more about Bullhorn or our products, we, have, uh, we actually have our annual event coming up uh, on the 11th and 12th of October. Um, it's called Bullhorn Live. Uh, this year is the first year we're pushing it over two days. Uh, and we're excited to see as many of you as possible there. Uh, for today's webinar, we're, we're really pleased to welcome uh, Lisa Jones and Wayne Barkley from Barkley Jones, uh, who are one of Bullhorn's training partners. Today, Lisa and Wayne are going to talk you through the importance of CRM, uh, what value it will give you, uh, and why your CRM should be the number one element of your technology stack today. Uh, this is obviously something that Bullhorn, we, we agree with very strongly. Um, and in addition to Wayne and Lisa, we also have our very own Andy Ingham, who's our VP of sales, uh, who'll be uh, on hand to chime in with some, some useful information and tips uh, when needed. Uh, so for now, I'm gonna pass things over to, to Andy. Hey, thank you, Charlie, and good morning, everyone. So as Charlie said, my name's Andy Ingham. I'm VP of sales here at Bullhorn. I've got responsibility for our existing clients and growth of our business across EMEA and Asia Pack. So here at Bullhorn, we've developed a range of cloud-based recruitment applications to help grow your agency business. And our flagship product and very pertinent today's webinar is uh, Bullhorn CRM, which we've developed on a platform that's been built with a mobile-first methodology in mind. We focus on increasing recruiters' efficiency, client health, and ultimately revenue growth of your agencies. And we do that through um, automatically capturing data to drive that efficiency of a uh, a well-qualified database, providing pre predictive intelligence to recruiters so uh, there's no need to be blindsided and there's awareness around next steps, but ultimately delivering real results fast. Very pleased uh, and honored to be part of the webinar today, and I'm going to hand over to Lisa Jones now from Barclay Jones. Hi, everybody. So if you can tweet, um, just give us a tweet in your Twitter hand with your Twitter hand into the chat. Obviously, we're Barclay Jones, we've got Bullhorn UK, and obviously, please use the hashtag Recruit Clever. It'd be really good to see you online, and obviously, we'll engage back. So, welcome everyone, and happy Friday. 100 years today, women could sign up for the army. Who'd have thought it? We've been fighting all that time. There we go. Right, so we're talking about CRM first. We're massively, massively passionate about that at Barclay Jones, and ultimately, our reason for being is to make recruiters more successful. So we do three things. We do recruitment technology, for example, Bullhorn and all the other systems that are available to, to recruiters, including websites, et cetera. We work with recruitment leaders, IT leaders, marketing leaders to make their technology first within their business, deliver ROI, help them make decisions about how to use it, speed up the business processes and ultimately implement stuff. We work with recruitment marketeers of all levels. One of our uh, recent proud moments was when one of our big clients, Fircroft, won Marketing Department of the Year with Recruiter. So we're very, very happy with that because we do a lot of mentoring and coaching with that team. And we also do recruiter success training. As far as we're concerned, often the problem with sales can be the problem between the chair and the keyboard. The systems that they've got are slowing them down. They suffer from option paralysis and training has become a dirty word, whereas actually it's pretty critical. 
We even need training to have a baby and drive a car these days. So the eight hours that we're spent at a desk trying to sell to people, we need help with that. So if you need any help with that, let us know. We've also got a couple of um, other introductions. So we've got, obviously got Wayne, say hi, Wayne. Hi, everybody, welcome. So Wayne is the director of the Barclay Jones. Funnily enough, Barclay Jones, imaginatively named, and for all you lovely recruiters out there that have the audacity to name the business after yourselves, welcome to our crowd. We've got a couple of freebies to give away today. Now, if you put the word stop in your chat, we won't stop the webinar, don't worry, but we will, free of charge, send you our stop ebook. We've been speaking to 22 recruitment leaders around the world on what they think you could be forgiven for not doing anymore because it's just been and gone. Some really, really helpful tips in there and actually very speedy. You're not going to go white reading it in terms of we'll go grey overnight. It's a nice quick fix for a lot of the things that you'll do and big confidence builder. Also, awards season is upon us. We had the Global Recruiter Awards last week. A couple of weeks before that, as I mentioned, the Recruiter Awards. We've got uh, Recruitment International, AppsCo, et cetera, coming up. If you want our view on how to enter and win and get ROI from awards, oh, and by the way, even if you don't want to um, enter an award, how to get ROI from other people entering awards, then drop us a line or put the word awards into your chat facility. So to kick off this webinar, we want to make sure at Barclay Jones that your CRM system, your recruitment software is your USP, your unique selling point. Both Wayne and I have been in the recruitment industry since 2000, either through a blend of recruiting roles, operations roles, IT directorial roles, but ultimately growth roles. And USP is something that's very rare in recruitment right now, but ultimately we think that really, your CRM system needs to be at the front of this. You as a salesperson, as a marketeer, as a, uh, a recruitment leader need to be sat in front of your clients and go, yeah, 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 we've all got access to LinkedIn, but our CRM, which has got nurtured, genuine talent, and especially with GDPR coming to kick our butts in two years, that's the bit that makes me different from my competitors, and that's the bit you're wanting to pay for so we can we crack on and take the brief. So a USP is very, very critical. So we're going to talk about something called SPIN today. There's lots of different sales models out there, but we've been working with a lot of recruiters in the last six to 12 months on not SPIN selling as such, but SPIN case studies, SPIN testimonials. And I want to really talk about SPIN from a CRM perspective because we want to sell your CRM back to you. And we want to give you some practical tips on how to create a USP out of your CRM, how to create a CRM first culture within your business. And I know Andy's going to interject as well. So we've got lots of content to deliver. So, interestingly, um, on LinkedIn a few weeks back, uh, someone ironically from Bullhorn mentioned my name because they were having a debate online about LinkedIn and, and what it's like and CRM. And he said, oh, you know, Lisa would say that LinkedIn or, or CRM is a poor man's LinkedIn. And I actually went on and disagreed, not in a nasty way, because I kind of like the fact that my name was mentioned, obviously, but I kind of see LinkedIn, uh, your CRM system as a, as a rich man's LinkedIn. It's a bit like, you know, imagine you're JK from Jamiroquai and you've got a, a garage full of Ferraris, which one do I take out today? I'm sure he's probably got a favorite, but all of us would be blown away if we saw which ones he actually had in his garage. I think CRM has become just another bit, another bit of kit for a lot of businesses, but oh my God, would the finance director appreciate you for saying that? Would your clients respect you for saying that? Or do you pretend or sell the fact that you've got a best in class system with crap data on it that you never use because actually LinkedIn feels better or my brain or my Excel spreadsheet? So I think it's a very expensive asset, apart from obviously your rent and your staff. And obviously, ultimately, if you don't rate it, your candidates won't rate it, your clients won't rate it. And a lot of my recruitment clients have investors so they won't rate it either. Trust me, CRM is going to be where it's at in the next three to five years when you come to sell, when you come to recruit, when you come to get other investors into your business. So to begin with, we're going to obviously talk about spin. And obviously the idea of spin is just to talk about what the story is in the market right now and what the current situation is with a lot of the recruitment bodies out there. So there's a poll that Charlie's going to kick off straight away. I want to know what percentage of placements you currently make from your CRM system. So let's just take 10 seconds to fill that in because this is not complicated. If you don't know the answer, there's no shame in that. We're not going to publish the results of this poll. I'm just interested behind the scenes because obviously I'm a marketeer as well by trade. So want to really know what percentage of placements you make from your CRM. OK, Charlie, feel free to close that poll now and we'll move on. 
Lovely. No, the current situation is this. According to some surveys that were run last year by Axco and Deloitte, 65% of you want to increase your profit this year. I'd love to know what the other 35% are going to do, but you know, 65% of you want to, or their top priority is to increase profit. But interestingly, when we survey our clients, we do a lot of work with the recruitment industry just surveying them. 33% of the vacancies that you have are still open after three months. And by the way, they're not always contract vacancies or perm vacancies that you're doing a massive search for. There's no excuses here. That's a lot of vacancies. And actually as well, 20% of the sales leads on your systems are only ever followed up. The other 80% are just sat there, which is terrifying, I think, when I speak to clients. They're saying, I want to do more with what I've got. So that's something just a sort of you have a lot to work with. The other poll that we found was very interesting is that 90 percent of recruitment leaders have told Barclay Jones that they think their CRM is the first port of call. And initially we believe them. It's like fantastic. That's brilliant. We've been working in this industry for nearly 20 years. I used to be an IT director in recruitment. That's music to my ears. But then we thought we'd ask their recruiters exactly the same question. And the disparity was massive. So in other words, 90% of recruitment leaders think the CRM is really, really key, whereas only 70%, 17% of their staff do. So there's a 73% gap in between a recruiter and the leader of that business. And obviously that gap means that we're not placing vacancies quickly enough. We're using external systems that either are invisible or insecure, or systems that actually our competitors, candidates and clients also have access to. And then to hit all of that on the head, because my, my business is a training business as well, we speak to too many recruitment leaders who go, no, we have some training on this. We've got some super users in the business. We haven't really got time to train. We need to get on the phone. And I'm like, seriously, all of this is unraveling. You've spent a massive amount of money on this Ferrari, but you're not prepared to learn how to drive it. And I'm not convinced as much as that might be a terrible analogy, but actually think about it. Lewis Hamilton does not drive crap cars. And equally, he's had a huge amount of experience on how to drive his beautiful McLaren. So let's have a think about that. Now, I want you to pop into your chat facility right now. Again, we're not going to publish the results of this, but I just want to know which CRM, which recruitment software are you using right now? And if you're in the process of moving to another CRM, pop that in as well, because I'm just interested. We're not going to publish this stuff. But I'm interested to see, and I always come up with stuff that I've never heard of, even though I've been doing this for a while, but I'm always interested to see what's out there. Another stat, which is a little bit scary, is that 80% of the placements our clients made last year, the candidates already existed on your CRM system, but 60% of your staff were saying we're candidate poor. Please think about this. At the same time, 44% of your staff are going, uh, CRM, whatever. And 22% of them were working on really old, crappy tech. So all of this is adding up to, are we going to get this problem sorted? We've got a client at the moment, there are about 80 recruiters strong. Uh, we did a bit of a CRM first process with them um, as a result of them admitting that it took eight weeks to fill a contract role, but ironically with a candidate that had already been on the system for 16 weeks, but they'd sourced that candidate from a job board. Lots of my clients are coming to me saying, Lisa, I wanna get rid of job boards or I wanna massively slash my job board budget, but I'm frightened of doing that, that fear of missing out. So again, all paths lead back to the data that you own and that you should be respecting. Think about as well another poll that we did with a 600 person recruiter last year, 50% of their time was being spent on the free version of LinkedIn. So you add that up, this particular client on average, including on costs, was spending about 15K per head per year. That's a lot of money and time being wasted sourcing from a system that you don't own with data that's not that clean only probably to find out that 80% of it was on your system to begin with. So again, I'm trying to set the story in the situation here because we have a saying in our business that recruiters are often data rich but information candidate and loyal client poor. That's the bit that is a big pain in the backside for all of you. Your clients will give you jobs to too many people. Your candidates aren't loyal to you. They might even leave on the first day and currently the stat is 4% of talent stops on their first day and quits. And as well, information, stupid amounts of data, but not enough information to move your business forward. So from a situation perspective, it's pretty, pretty dire. And as well, as at the same time, people are telling Deloitte and Apsco that they want more tech. And I'm like, don't you have enough already? <laughs> don't you have stuff that's best in class that you just need to use better? And if you don't, get off it and buy something else. Now, I know that Andy wants to interject occasionally, so I'm going to take a breath now. Andy, do you have anything to say about the current state of affairs with CRM in the UK or anything that you've seen on these slides? 
Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Lisa. I, I love that example around the contract maintenance engineer taking uh, taking time to fill there and the candidates already on the database. So when I when I speak to recruitment leaders, um, they often tell me that data is their number one asset. And then you really fast get into a debate over quantity versus quality, and that can almost become an obsession at times. So I always like to ask, what percent of the candidate database are you engaged with? How does your CRM support that? And how do you measure that, that candidate um, engagement and that candidate management? And that's where you really get into the value of your own CRM and the, and the quality of the data that you're holding internally. Fantastic. All important questions and all questions that a lot of the recruitment leaders, when we sit down with them, have never really had the time to fathom. You know, the average recruitment leader in the UK does not know their time to hire. The average recruitment consultant doesn't know their cost of hire. So all of this money is centralized, all of these costs are centralized, and the FD is literally rubbing the hair off of their temples. All the while, we're making money, but we don't know what the cost of making that money is. And again, this is where CRM should be able to help with that. I'm going to move on to Wayne now, he's going to talk about problems. So uh, this is an area that I really get excited about, understanding what problems uh, businesses have with their CRM. And as a, a business analyst myself, I like to go in and understand uh, the challenges, uh, understand the behaviours of what's driving those potential problems. So very quickly in your chat, can you tell me in one word or two words what your biggest issues are? Again, we're not going to publish these results. They're purely for my own enjoyment. <laughs> Your enjoyment. I am enjoying That's it. what his Friday nights are all about, folks. Make him happy. Analyzing. Okay, so when I speak to clients, I have a, a, a general uh, overview of what it is they're trying to achieve. And they say they want to make more money from their business. They want to grow their business. They want to understand why they're spending so much money on so many different systems and trying to get their head around as to why the most important system that they do have is not really engaged with as much. Um, they all always look at their, their cost of spend. They always look at all the technology that they're buying and always think, well, actually, we've not really moved forward um, uh, 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 in terms of our, our sales. So this is what we see. There's very little or no engagement with the system. Or what's, what engagement there is, it's sporadic. One team may work brilliantly, another team may not work. Everyone says the system is rubbish, and I put that in, in, in inverted commas. Um, it, it, historically, CRM um, has always been a, a challenge to get people engaged with it because it may not have the functionality, but things have moved forward significantly. Systems have become much faster. They've become much more reliable as well. But the challenge that most people have and most people don't realize is that actually it's the data that's the problem. If you have sporadic data entry across the system, therefore you have sporadic information and that therefore means that you met, you're unable to make informed decisions. And that means that basically lots of people go in lots of different directions when they're looking for data. There's also options paralysis. Uh, I've been working with one client today, uh, sorry, last week, and they were, they've got uh, three CRM systems that are on the go. Um, they have LinkedIn recruiter accounts, they have Excel spreadsheets, and they even have the system whereby uh, as soon as a new candidate comes in uh, to one of the CRM systems, it gets emailed across everybody and everyone's using their outlook. So there are a huge number of systems out there. Um, this causes great expense, it causes massive disruption as to where the data is, um, uh, and it causes confusion. And the other most challenging and biggest problem that I see is that recruitment companies are really good at training. However, they're not good at investing in training. And you have to continuously train your consultants. You have to continuously invest in looking at their standards and their processes and monitoring what they do. And this is not so much a problem at the consultant layer. It's probably a, uh, it's, it's a, it is a problem at the management layer. Managers have to be the super users of the system in my world. Let's talk about the implications. Okay, so obviously one of the things that we're interested in, and oh, actually, before we do that, Andy, from a problem perspective, are there any other problems that you see as, you know, the chief head honcho of Bullhorn in this region when you're going in and talking to clients about CRM? What other issues do they have? Hey, I see a lot of the same things. Or I certainly hear a lot of the same things. So when we're, when we're out in the market talking to people and we're asking the questions, you know, why, why are you looking at changing your CRM? Or more importantly, why are your recruiters not using the technology that you've currently invested in today, regardless, regardless of what that is? 
Um, we, we hear a lot of common answers coming back, um, and some of these Wayne's already uh, already covered on there. So, you know, it takes too long to add data into the database. The creators don't trust the search results that get returned on occasions. It's too complicated, or I just don't know how to use it. And that absolutely goes back to your earlier point, Lisa, around, you know, investing in training of, uh, of your CRM system. And my all-time favorite is we do things differently around here, so we can't find an application that works right for us. And you can quite easily get into a leadership versus technology debate at that point in time. So, you know, Barclay Jones will certainly be able to help you with uh, with the leadership piece there. But I, I kind of want to focus on the technology for obvious reasons. Um, so, um, you know, I, I fundamentally believe your technology that you're using there for your CRM should be intuitive and easy to use. Um, you've got to remove wherever possible that requirement to manually add data into the database. You know, at heart, um, we are all salespeople, and we're not the best people at, um, at, at administration. And so if you can um, utilize a piece of technology that automatically captures data and removes that need, you just, you're just going to have a better um, qualified database all around. Whatever your secret source is, you know, you want your CRM system to be configurable so you can drive that process. So technology is supporting your leadership requirements. Um, because ultimately here we're trying to drive recruiter efficiency. Absolutely. Brilliant. All good stuff. Thank you. So let's look at the implications. We're on the eye of spin now. So this is the bit where I actually get flip. I actually get very excited about many things, but the implication of it not being fixed for me is just ridiculous. But it's actually the impact of the solution of becoming a CRM first business, having a USP is beyond most of my clients' wildest dreams, and often what they think is it's therefore insurmountable, but actually totally, totally achievable. So, come back to me via chat. If you don't turn your CRM into a USP, what does that mean for your business in the next one to five years? All the things that Andy's just listed, the issues between the chair and the keyboard, the way your clients disrespect your offering, by saying, well, you're just another recruiter with just another database. I've got the same access. The only reason I'm using you is because I have to, not because you're the best people for the job. What's the impact on your business? And maybe for maybe the older recruitment leaders, and I put myself in this box, unfortunately, in the day before social media really started battering us around and created this paralysis of options, where actually our database was king and people were addicted to it. And that includes our clients, investors and recruiters. So just have a think about that. You've got to think about what is the point of the system you're spending so much flipping money on? So if we're spending 50% of our day sourcing from external systems, how much is that costing you? And obviously we've done an estimate here, but I want you to really think about and look, make an action plan from today's webinar. Take something away and figure out if your recruitment team are spending 50% of their day sourcing from external systems, which also cost or don't cost because time is money. What is that costing your business? And how could you reinvest that into training or better config of the CRM that you've got or upgrading to a better version? Really got to think about the opportunity costs. Every recruitment business I go into, the mantra is get on the phone. It might even be a little bit more sweary than that. But obviously, a lot of the reasons why recruiters don't get on the phone is because they're spending far too much of their day doing stuff to, cut, to circumvent their systems, or they just don't have enough time to go and meet clients, to interview candidates, to do the right level of sourcing. You've got to think about how we can remove that 50%, maybe even take it down to 40%. That would be a massive impact. If each of your recruiters could place one more candidate a year, what kind of profit margin are you looking at? That might be all you need to think about. So we've got to think about time is a critical factor for all recruitment businesses. You know, times may have changed in the last 20 years in recruitment, but the one thing we still don't have, and maybe Bullhorn have a plug-in for this, is a time machine. I don't know, Andy, are you building anything like that right now? That might <laughs> yeah. Should I say that's on roadmap? Maybe not. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> on the roadmap for 4,025. So training your recruiters on your CRM is time consuming. How time consuming is it not doing that? What kinds of things do you want them to do differently? And my business regularly goes into um, all manner of recruitment businesses that maybe had the training when the system was rolled out, but there was no management training on the system. There was no resource training on the system. There was no vacancy training on the system. It was just training on the system. So then what we do is we go back in and we create adoption and engagement, which is the most critical element in my view of any CRM implementation. Because I always say to my clients, 
crap analogy car alert people you could build the most beautiful formula one car but if someone as sassy as um lewis hamilton sits in it and goes nah i'm not driving that you're kind of screwed and that's what happens every day in a recruitment business here. lots of beautiful um whippersnapper recruitment consultants who refuse to use your systems because it's meh what's the point of that and obviously think about performance management you don't pay your sales managers to performance manage your recruiters you pay them to help them bring the money in there's a big big difference so please think about how systems might be stopping the money from coming in think about how quickly you're filling your jobs please and is the system that you're using right now helping you do that or preventing you from doing that Think about loyalty, that's an implication. Can you increase loyalty? And the reason we put these implications in is because when we've surveyed our clients, they've told us these are their genuine problems. Lack of time, lack of client, candidate, and recruiter loyalty. Don't you want better recruiters, candidates, and clients? And again, if recruiters don't give us stuff about the systems that you are spending money on, then we've got a problem. And especially when you tell us, or 61% if you told Apsco and Deloitte last year, that finding new staff was a key priority for this year, then actually, you know, maybe keeping the ones you've got and keeping them addicted to your internal processes is key, as well as bringing new people in and getting them addicted to your internal processes. Something very close to our hearts is security. There's a lot of crap going on in the world right now involving data security. And obviously, when we go down the GDPR route, and I hope you're all... Um, thinking about that right now, that data is going to be a super precious commodity. So we've got to really think about how you're managing your data and how secure it actually is. But I want you to imagine the impact of CRM as a USP. There is a business out there, they will remain nameless, who decided to make their CRM as a USP and they reduced their placement ratio from 33 days to 17. In other words, they massively sped up their ability to make money. They doubled the jobs they placed, they doubled the candidates, doubled the clients, doubled the fees, and obviously made massive profits because they were spending less money and all that extra third party stuff. And as a result of that, everyone got emotional, including myself. But just please think about how much money are you spending to stay the same when actually the opportunity costs are massive? Do you have any views on that, Andy? Yeah, this is, a, this is a great example. And, uh, and the business in mind did this intentionally. Um, and they were, they were there to prove to their own business that putting their CRM first was part um, of their absolute candidate strategy. So, you know, they went down a path of, for a period of time, turning off LinkedIn, turning off the job boards, and just used their CRM. And why did they do it? Well, the stats on the screen there. You know, they, they knew from historic placements that it took them 33 days on average to place a candidate that they found from LinkedIn. Um, and when they utilized the power of their own database, they took that down to 17 days. So 16 days saved. So that's, you know, by my maths, that's potentially over six extra placements a year per recruiter. And that's, that has phenomenal business impact by just going down the path, as Lisa's saying, of putting CRM first. Absolutely, absolutely. And by the way, if LinkedIn are listening and job boards are listening, we're not out to bin these lovely systems. We're out to create a viable workflow. We're out to make sure that candidates and clients' data is treated with respect and ultimately recruiters know, without having to spin around three times and wear the right underwear on a Thursday, what their job is. So it's important that we understand that all of these systems have a part to play, but ultimately at the center of this is the recruiter sat at their desk using a system that your, your clients and candidates assume you are 120% engaged with. So Wayne's going to talk about the need or the N in the spin. Okay, so let's talk about the need. So what can you do in order to improve what you've currently got? So it depends where you are within your recruitment life cycle. So if you had a CRM first culture, what impact would it have? on your business? Would you increase sales? Would you get more clients? Are you losing clients currently because of bad management? Do you have client or candidate ownership rules in your business? So if you could just drop me a note as to what that impact would be, uh, that would be great. Okay, so if your CRM was a USP, what would that mean to your clients? What would that mean to your recruiters? And what would mean that to your candidates? And on top of that, if you're thinking of selling your business, having a robust uh, workflow that everyone understands and the data can be uh, uh, have a, a monetary value associated to it is absolutely critical. 
So your USP could be, we have a unique database of candidates. It could be, we have, when you're introducing uh, uh, consultants into your business, we have uh, all our clients on our, on our, on our da database already. So they are, are more warm leads as opposed to code calling. So there are three, maybe four areas that you need to really focus around when you're looking at your CRM. You need to look at your people, you need to look at your processes, and you need to look at your technology. And underpinning all this is, as a recruitment director, you need to be thinking about the leadership of these three, three, these three strategies, and you need to be looking at how you train and how you monitor um, both those people, both the systems and also the processes. So let's talk about people. You need to get an investment strategy in place. Stop talking about training as a one-off hit. It has to be an ongoing strategy. It has to be at Go Live. There is a, this wonderful program that sat in place that everyone understands that they know they're going to be trained up, that they know they're going to be monitored against. It's great if you've got dashboards in your business, but I know lots of clients that say, oh, these dashboards are wonderful, and within two or three weeks, people stop looking at them. So you have to start getting management to start looking at and monitoring how people are using the system. You need to get regular feedback from your users on the processes that are in place or the challenges that they've got. Far too often, it's one or two people who are the biggest advocates of the system. So they're the ones that basically make all the changes or request all the changes. Actually getting working groups together to really focus around what goes well, who are the best sellers, why are they the best sellers is really, really important. As a business, you have to understand that data is king. I've been working with a client, uh, a very successful CEO, um, who would regularly phone up any of his staff and say the data is not in the system, can you please put it in the system correctly? So when it comes to things like placements or when they're working with commissions, et cetera, et cetera, if the, system, if the data is not in the CRM system, he phones them up. That's how important data is to him. We've talked about monitoring and improving productivity. Monitoring shouldn't be seen as a weapon. It needs to be seen as a productivity tool. It needs to be seen as, you guys are currently doing this. However, these guys over here are slightly more effective and they do X, Y, and Z. And that's because we're looking at dashboards, we're looking at workflows, we're looking at the outputs of what they do, and ultimately we're looking at sales. The other process as well from a people perspective is training as we've already mentioned, and that investment strategy has got to be underpinned by a reviewing process. It has to be monitored, and that has to be at the, the, the management layer as opposed to the individual uh, consultant layer or alternative to the training department layer. Training department has to work more effectively across the board, especially with managers and leaders. Let's talk about processes. You need to break your process down. You really need to understand what parts of the process are effective. You need to understand what parts of the system are effective as well. So look at your new business development process. Look at how you engage with your candidates. Look at your payroll process. I've got a client um, we're looking at their payroll process, 70% of their timesheets are queried as they come through the door. That's a phenomenal amount of querying that, that takes place within the payroll department, and that takes up their time, it takes up consultants' time, it makes them look not particularly brilliant from a candidate and client perspective as well. So break your process down, get everyone to understand what part of the process is they're working within. Are your uh, recruiters 360 recruiters so they need to know everything are they very targeted are they only resources or new business development managers talked about the reporting process and the monitoring again the processes need to be looked at they need to be uh, assessed and regularly monitored and fed back to the consultants uh, and on top of that look at the successes and ways in which you can improve the system publish those successes really have stand-up meetings if you do once a month process, then remind people about what processes uh, are really effective. Let's look at technology. The next strategy has to be around, have I got the right technology in my business? Have I got the right technology and am I entering the right data at the right times? So before you upgrade, you need to make sure that you understand why it is you're upgrading your technology. Many of you would already been going down that route, looking at the new technologies that are out there, but sometimes it may not be the technology that's the problem, it's probably the data. So you need to look at your data and whether or not your data strategy and whether or not the data is being entered in the right place at the right time. And does everyone understand what data needs to be entered into what parts of the system? I mean, many people will come back and say, oh, it's too complicated because the fields are all over the place, at which point that may be a time to start looking at a new replacement system. 
you need to look at your system and you need to evolve the system over the, the, the life of it, uh, of, li uh, of the life cycle of it. Uh, you need to have a proper change control process in place. So we had a client who went live a couple of weeks ago. Uh, immediately, people have been asking for changes to be made to the system, and all these changes suddenly started taking place. And now everyone's confused as to what the process is and what data uh, fields need to be entered in. That change control process is absolutely critical. Um, the other thing that you could look at as well, and Bullhorn have a, a really good uh, app store, uh, the, the exchange, um, uh, to integrate other systems into the CRM system. That helps integrate and that helps the, the flow of the data th through the system. Andy, have you got any other comments in terms of what else you would consider uh, what people should need from their system? Um, I don't think I've got any new comments though, Wayne. I mean, we, um, Charlie's going to give um, contact details on the back end because we'd love to talk to anyone who's um, looking to refresh their CRM technology or any part of their select integrated um, application suite. But I do fully agree with Wayne though, in the fact that's just one of the three pillows. The people and process are just as important, and absolutely that needs to be underpinned by strong leadership. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so practical tips. So one of our clients has recently had a global bullhorn day. And they basically had no LinkedIn, they had no job boards, and they had just the database. They purely focused around looking at just using the, 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 the bullhorn system. The way that they were going about it was very much to create some um, environment. Now, Spencer Ogden are another client that's done this. We've, we're starting to spot them all popping up and certainly we're working with our own clients on this as well. But the idea of this particular screenshot is Spencer Ogden ran their own and they're a big client of the lovely Bullhorn. I know Andy wants to talk to bit about those in a minute. So if I, if I start talking about the stuff you're going to talk to me about, Andy, then just press pause. But certainly from Ben Carter. You're okay, carry on. Yeah, thank you. From Ben Carter's perspective, it's not that they switched off everything. It's just that they started to create a bit of a change and they were doing regular changes. So it's not like, that's it, everybody stop what you're doing. It was more encouragement. But what was interesting in terms of the case study is that they had people on hand on every single site around the business. And just think about how big that business is, people, so no excuses. They had people all around the business ready to train the people to use the system appropriately on those given days. Ben appreciates, for example, that it's not going to be an overnight change, but, and I know Andy will, will share some more information about this in a minute, but the one thing he said to me is, Lise, the point of this is just to give people permission to only use that system. And initially they were expecting a bit of a, a bit of a pain in the backside approach actually, but really surprising and very, very positive results. And they're gonna be regularly repeating that. And all I said to him is just make sure you don't sign off any holidays for that day. So the little crafty recruiters can sign themselves off. <laughs> now, Andy, I'm gonna talk about some other tips in a minute, but do you wanna just focus on this particular case study before we continue? Hey, I think uh, I think very quickly, and I think probably just to add actually, Lisa, no, no new information here, but you know, for, for Spencer Ogden, this, this is part of a broader change management program. Um, and really, it's um, it's like driving value from the investment they made in technology. So this this wasn't about saying we're turning our boards on any external sources, any LinkedIn, any any job boards, you know, for forever in a day. This is about driving a cultural change in the business, so that the uh, so Spencer Ogden as a as a global organisation uh, can start driving more value out of the investment they've already made in technology. Absolutely, thank you for that. So if I, I'm a big fan of if you're a 10 man band and the average recruitment business in the UK is under 10 um, or and that's over 75 percent of the market um, or slightly bigger like Spencer Ogden, you can do this. It does take a while. So if you want this time next year to have a CRM first culture, you need to kind of start now. In all of the experience that Wayne and I have had in the last 20 years of rolling out CRM, and don't be scared because we said this, what I'm about to say once and someone kind of flipped their lid. It takes about a year for a business to fully go, huh. Oh, that was done. Not a year to go live, but a year for the FD, the, the MD, the CEO, the CIO to say, glad we did that, but you, it takes a year of hard work. And I'm not trying to disparage changing CRM, it just means you get some great results within a year. I mean, we're six months in now, we're blinking and it's just happened. So you've got to keep it really, really simple. So what I'm thinking here is we need to think about is we need to get this CRM first process in order to create addiction to our system. 
systems. We need to create um, a CRM first process so that we can pitch our CRM like we used to. We can make it desirable. And when it comes to the general data protection regulations that are coming out in less than two years, you need an internal system which is a magnet for clients and candidates, not something that they're going to use to sue you because you're storing their data inappropriately. So just please think about this. Think about the fact your investors are going to want to look at your data and say, are you compliant? And not just are you compliant, but other people on your system really in love with you. And I think that's where we need to get back to. Wayne's got quite a bit to talk about when it comes to data. Data we've talked about um, briefly previously. Uh, you need to make the data sexy and you need to make sure that people understand what data they've got and where it resides. By having a CRM first culture, you're really focusing around getting people to, and your consultants specifically, to put the data into the CRM first. And then from that, integrations through things like payroll, uh, through things like your finance system, et cetera, et cetera, will then drive those process in the back end. But you need to ensure that as, as a business, you understand who is responsible for the data, who is responsible for adding data as well. So does anyone and everyone have access to be able to create candidates or create contacts or create companies? Um, if you work in a very uh, niche marketplace and you know you have a finite number of contacts or clients, then therefore you might want to uh, suggest that, that you have a team of people who are solely responsible for that data. They become the data gatekeepers. Um, it's worked on some very large organizations, it works on some very small organizations as well. And that will reduce things like duplicates, et cetera, et cetera. I've just had someone tweet, quite a cute tweet actually, and it says, I'd say that data is king and GDPR is the queen that will protect the king. I quite like that. Like that. Is that a movie in the making? Right, big fan of making CRM easy. The word intuitive is overused in everything. Cars, phones, the lot. I had my phone swapped out last night because a splodge had appeared in the middle of it. I consider myself pretty tech savvy and I'm still having some issues porting everything across. I'm pretty intuitive as a creature. I like tech as long as it gets me home on time. But the sales process is not intuitive and CRM should wholly support the sales process. So making CRM as easy as possible, capture more data, not more fields, yeah? More data to create more direct information that you need for sourcing is key. Remove the noise. Now, again, Andy said this earlier, and so did Wayne. When we meet recruiters, they say, oh, the system doesn't do what I want it to do. And actually, when we go in and do business process mapping and engineering, what we often find, ladies and gentlemen, is what you're trying to do is just too complicated. I see in the current market, when you change CRM or you review your CRM, because sticking with what you've got, if it's a great CRM, could be the best solution, is all around looking at, am I actually working in today's market or am I working in the market that's 20 years old using today's systems? Really got to think about that. And obviously, crazy suggestions like, let's just make the first page really simple. Let's trick the recruiters into wanting to use this stuff. You know, let's learn some lessons from the big boys out there, LinkedIn, um, Apple, uh, lastminute.com. They want your dollars, and obviously as a result of that, they're making buying from them extremely easy. We're trying to sell our CRM usage to our recruiters, but we make it very complicated. As a marketing mentor to the recruitment industry, as well as an IT director, I don't see enough of this. I don't see, if I go and see recruiters, show me your first 100 candidates that you know, you're gonna make the most money from. Tell me who your best 10 clients are, or tell me who you want to have placed within clients by the end of this year. Again, and I think Kieran will probably agree with me on this, if we can get ourselves sorted with basic stuff like this from a GDPR perspective and nurture with fantastic content, comms and, and care, then ultimately GDPR is not a threat to our businesses at all. Nurturing is key. Nurturing isn't just getting on the phone. There's lots of stuff that your marketing departments can do behind the scenes, but only if you've got gorgeous, gorgeous data. So we see that there's five steps to CRM addiction, five steps to CRM as USP, five steps to CRM first. We obviously want you to make your processes extremely clear. When does CRM fit in? And the 90% of recruitment out there that assume it's first are currently wrong. 
We want you to make your data sexy. Make it rewarding to have a clean desk, and in inverted commas, clean data. Make your CRM easy to use. Nurture your top talent, and we include clients and actually recruiters in this, and make sure that training is absolutely normal. Do you have anything to add to that, Andy? No, I love I love the comments around make data sexy um, because it's you know we 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 live in a world of big data and um, and we collect more and more data and it kind of goes back to the earlier point um, around quantity versus quality but actually it's what you can do with that data that's most important and we, you know we're living in a world of uh, uh, robotic intelligence and, and artificial intelligence and getting getting predictive next steps. Um, to avoid being blindsided or being warned of a potential client's health issue or the best time to call a candidate or a client is immensely powerful information which you've got in your database um, but not all databases present that back to you as a, as a next step or as an actionable piece of information but I, I absolutely love the uh, you know point two on the make data sexy Absolutely. And it shouldn't just be sexy for your finance director or your IT director. It has to be sexy for John Smith, who sits at his desk all day long, eight to 10 hours a day, or Jane Smith, managing their data, managing their placement ratios, managing their profit margins. And I certainly know that Spoolhorn has a huge amount of tools on the system to allow them to do that. But obviously, we're still focused on all these extra third party systems. Right, so to summarize, the situation is you've got loads of bloody tech, ladies and gentlemen, and the problem that that's causing is you're losing time, potentially clients, genuinely talent, your recruiters are not engaged potentially, and the money, oh, you're just spending loads of it and not using it. So marketing are disconnected, big problem for the recruitment business industry at the moment, and obviously recruiters do this desk rental that I always come across, I call it hairdressing, they're renting a seat from you, using the things in the way that they see fit, and potentially taking data in their heads out of the business when they leave. The implication of that is that you're having to drop your margins, absolutely. It's less loyal, uh, recruiters are less loyal, and obviously investors are less likely to want to uh, actually invest in your business. So ultimately, you need a CRM culture. So ladies and gentlemen, quickly pop into your chat facility now and, and, and Charlie is going to read some of these out as they come along. But what are you going to do now? What's your takeaway? Right, so we've got a, a couple coming through. Um, a lot of people referring to the, the making data sexy comments um, and uh, focusing on uh, process uh, simplification. Uh, which is great to see. Uh, it's it's uh, something we hear a lot about uh, over at Borhorn in, around uh, streamlining processes and making uh, the job nice and simple. Um, lots more sexy data. Uh, data is king. Um, and uh, mainly this webinar has uh, stressed my points that I'm trying to make. So that's great, great news. Um, clearly, <coughs> a lot of people working on, on some of these elements already. Um, Brilliant. And finally, uh, love the five steps, uh, and I'm going to implement it in our business. So, all Brilliant. good news all around. Great. So, if you want to turn your CRM into a USP, put the word chat into your chat facility, and we'll get in touch. We're not going to spam you, bombard you. I'm certainly not going to turn up at your house in an hour. Don't worry. But we've obviously got a lot that we can talk to you about. So, drop us a line through chat. Don't forget our stop ebook. And also our awards, but put both words into your chat facility. And we've obviously got a blog, a YouTube channel, and a really good podcast channel that we're going to be interviewing Andy on very, very soon. So make sure you subscribe. I'll let you finish off now. Thanks, Charlie and Andy. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Wayne. Charlie, over to you. Not a problem. They, uh, just to, just to kind of um, repeat that, thank you very much to, to both Lisa and Wayne um, for, for uh, running the webinar today. Uh, big thank you to everybody who's been attending. Uh, we hope you found the information useful. Uh, if you do have any questions uh, about today's webinar, you're more than welcome to uh, drop us a call uh, for Bullhorn on 0203 617 6262. Uh, or if, if, if you'd rather, you can email us at sales at bullhorn.com. Uh, just so you're all aware, we will be uh, sending the recording out to all of the attendees uh, and keep an eye out for the email because we'll also be including uh, a very special 10% discount for Bullhorn Live uh, later this year 
Uh, again, that, that those dates are the 11th and 12th of October. Uh, so for now, just uh, finally, thank you again to, to both Lisa and Wayne and, and for Andy for jumping in uh, with some very useful information there. Thanks so much, guys.